All right, let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning, and we're glad to be in the house of the Lord on the Lord's Day. Thank you, Lord, for this day that we can worship you. We can assemble together. Lord, we're, we're busy enough the other six days. <laughs> Lord, with lots of stuff going on. Work, school, family, uh, running around, appointments. Lord, there's lots of things that take up our time, and usually we're exhausted, and we're tired, we're weary. Lord, we're thankful for a day that we can get away from a lot of that and worship you, draw our attention and focus in our heart and our spirit to you, Lord, for you are worthy. And Lord, I pray that we would remember this is the first day of the week. It's not the weekend. It's not the last day of the week, Lord. It's the day that sets the rest of the week in order. And so, Lord, I pray as we've come together to assemble with believers, to lift up our voice in song, to hear the word of God, to meditate, to serve, to minister, uh, to glorify you, Lord. I pray that we would be in the right frame of mind. Our heart would be prepared to receive the word. I pray that we've come today with a servant's heart. Lord, if we've come to serve today, we'll have a whole different outlook on the church services, Lord. Uh, we'll be looking at others and saying, God, use me today in the life of someone. Is there anything I can do today to serve you, Lord? And I pray I'd have that spirit in each one here today. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your goodness. Thank you for a beautiful week you've given us in weather. Now we're in September, Lord. We know you could come at any moment. But, Lord, as we prepare for today, as well as the church picnic tomorrow and other events coming up, Lord, uh, should you tarry, Lord, we pray that you would help us to do all things decently and in order. Lift up those in prayer that maybe you're sick, maybe you're not able to come physically, Lord, that maybe you're going through some challenges, that we could be a help and a blessing. We praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. And as they head out, if you'll open your Bibles to the book of Joshua, the last chapter of Joshua, Joshua 24, Joshua 24. All right, our teens and younger are headed out. You're turning to Joshua chapter 24. That's the sixth book of the Bible. like to welcome our newest member to the adult class, and that's McKenna back there. A little change in her life. She's always been in a, <laughs> she went from nursery to the elementary classes to the youth group team. Now she's like, oh man, ugh. You know, a lot of times you're like, oh man, I get thrown in here. Look at this group. Look at the age group. All the other time, think about it. Every time else, nursery zero to three, fours and fives, and then adult 18 to boom. <laughs> so, up to 100 can be. So that can be a challenge. Uh, perhaps at some point we continue to, Lord willing, grow. We might have a college and career singles class. We've had those in the past, Sunday school. That would be great to be able to do down the road sometimes. All right, Joshua chapter 24. Uh, we are still in our summer, if you would, where we're just having different men and different folks uh, speak and do Sunday school. I've got this one, Lord willing, next week, I believe Jose Gonzalez. The following week uh, will be Charlie, Lord willing. He'll be back, uh, should be back next, well, I hope he should be here by next Sunday, coming back on Friday this week. And uh, I asked him if he could, hey, how about you do Sunday school? If you've got any pictures, video, almost like a little mission, uh, missionary type thing, tell us about your trip and want to answer any questions. What, what did you do? What did you learn? That kind of a thing. So that's on the target for the 17th. And then that leads into missions conference. All right, which is hard to believe. Three weeks from now will be our finale, our final day of missions conference. And uh, that'll be missionary in Sunday school, missionary preaching in the morning, dinner on the grounds, church fellowship downstairs, back up for an afternoon service. And that's a big, big day for a church family as missions conference is right around the corner. And this will help draw our attention to missions uh, with uh, Charlie's Sunday School lesson. And then, by the way, the, the Sunday after missions conference, and we, we've had this schedule for months, well, probably half a year, uh, the TAC Clubs, our Missionary of the Month, our new Missionary of the Month for September. The TAC Clubs will be with us on that Sunday morning. They're on the deputation from the Philippines. And so we're looking, I'm looking forward to meeting them. I have not met them in person yet since I've been here. And so excited about them. So we'll have a missions month type thing, get our hearts and minds on missions. But not this morning. This morning, as far as Sunday school, we're going to be looking at Joshua. All right. So Joshua 24, we're going to do things in reverse. We're going to read the end of Joshua's life. And then we're going to backtrack and see how we ended up right here. All right. So Joshua 24, take a look at verse number one. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges 
and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. Now, if you look at chapter 23, verse 1, it's almost identical, except there's a little bit different wording. Chapter 23, 1 says, It came to pass a long time after that, the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all their enemies round about, that Joshua waxed old and stricken in age. So Joshua is at the very end of his life. Two times, chapter 23 and 24, could be the same day, it could be in the same week, we're not told. Two times he gathers Israel for final words, if you would. Not about him, really but about their history, about God. And he leaves them with a charge. Chapter 24, of course, draws our attention to verse number 15. Verse number 15, probably of all the verses in Joshua, the end of this verse will be the most famous. So Joshua is charging the people. His final words, I don't know if that's ever happened with you, perhaps. Maybe you lost a parent, a grandparent an older sibling. And maybe it wasn't sudden to the point where they were in a car accident, you didn't know it, but they were, they were dying. They were up in age. They had a sickness and the family had been called in. Or the nurses and doctors says you need to come. It, it could be at any moment. And, or perhaps you were in the room for weeks waiting and helping and the final opportunity perhaps if they were conscious and able to talk and you know the end is near. If it was a believer, even if it wasn't a believer, some final words perhaps, a mother to a child, a father to a child, a, a husband to a wife, whatever it may be, those, those final words. And if it was a believer and they had enough strength, maybe they wanted to leave something with their children. Here's Joshua. He's at the end of his life. He's about to die. He knows he's about to die. He's going to go off the scene. He gathers Israel, especially the leaders, and in the middle of his charge, verse 15, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Wow. You say, oh, well, who hadn't heard that? Who doesn't have that on a sign or a picture or artwork, you know? Who, who doesn't have that on a bookmark? Uh, who doesn't say that? For me in my house, I don't know what you're going to do because I can't make you. But you need to choose and everybody's going to choose. And if you want to serve the gods of Egypt and those, will know, fine. If you want to serve the gods of the Amorites and the Canaanites in which we've been here for years getting rid of, that's up to you. But I'm not. As for me and my house, we're serving Jehovah God. You could read the rest of that chapter. So what I want to look at, perhaps the most famous verse or quote that's tied in with Joshua. But you know what's interesting about Joshua? A famous quote, a famous verse from really a largely unknown and a very underappreciated Bible character. Many people, if you said, who said that, not hopefully our, not you, I hope, but many believers, but I don't know. Maybe they would know it was Joshua. Maybe they'd just say, I don't know who said that. Somebody did in Old Testament. Take some guesses. But even if you do know the quote well and you know the chapter here, many do not know the life of Joshua, who he was. And so I want to look at this morning in Sunday school, uh, the title, I don't usually give a title to a Sunday school lesson, but we're going to call it Joshua. From slave to leader. Wow, how did he get there? From a lot of times we're enamored with uh, biographies of well-known people, sometimes presidents, uh, athletes, uh, billionaires, and you know their stories, and, and we can learn from those. Wow, they were they were nothing. They were an orphan. They were adopted. They were uh, raised. You know, think of George Washington Carver and some others, Booker T. Washington, Harry Tubman. They were slaves. You know, or, or this here, this president was raised in a poor house. They had nothing. Or an abusive home, and, and look how look where they've come, and look look now how well no, they're not always they're, they're not always believers, but you can certainly learn from things from those. And how about Joshua? We forget from slave to leader. Who who was Joshua? Why was he chosen to succeed Moses? What was his background? What kind of man was he? 
Do we know a lot about it? No, we might have some snippets. We might have some grains of truth. You, you may have done a Bible study. You may have in a Sunday school lesson. You may have obviously read through Joshua probably as you've read through the Bible or the Old Testament or different portions. So we're going to look at that. So before we do that, though, it has been a long time. Let's take a short quiz. You got, a, you got your bulletin there? You got a pen or pencil? Are you with me? Are you daydreaming already this morning? Hopefully not. You're weary from whatever you did yesterday? Let's take a short quiz. Five quick questions. I don't think I've done a quiz in at least six months. All right. And so let's do a quick quiz. Can't look in the Bible. I'm going to go pretty quick here. You can do it by yourself. You can do it with your spouse if you're with your husband or wife. You can do it wherever. Do it with a friend if you're sitting by a friend. All right. We want everybody to participate. Just jot it out here. Scrap piece of paper or something. All right. If not, you have to do it mentally. All right. Here we go. Number one, five quick questions. A well-known Bible trivia question, sometimes a joke or a riddle, Involves Joshua and his father. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, you will no doubt miss this question. That's okay. All right. Uh, but a fairly well-known Bible trivia question or joke involving uh, Joshua involves him and his father. So if you know what I'm talking about, fill it in. Joshua, the son of blank. <laughs> That's all I can give you. I'm sorry. If you're like, what are you talking about? You, you're, is, it's like Nathan in Hebrew up there. What are you doing? All right? We'll explain that if you don't know what that is. All right? Joshua, the son of blank. Number two, what tribe was Joshua from? And I'll give you choices so that you can narrow it down if you're not sure. What tribe? There's 12 tribes. What tribe was Joshua from? Was it Levi, Ephraim, Judah, or Benjamin? What tribe was Joshua from? Was he from Levi, Ephraim, Judah, or or Benjamin, you have a 25% chance to get that without looking on any of the pages of the Bible, all right, or any study helps. <laughs> number three, number three, can you name two to three stories or events involving Joshua that are not found in the book of Joshua? There you go, so jot a couple down. Can you name two or three fairly well-known stories Involving Joshua, but not in the book of Joshua. So you say, okay, as soon as someone says Joshua, and I say, all right, think of anything you can about Joshua, anything about his life, anything he ever did. Can you come up with just two or three? You don't have to write the whole story, just a, just a snippet. Can you know any story or Bible events that are, you know, not talking about Joshua across the street, all right, or you know, Joshua said hi to Moses, not that kind of stuff. Can you name two or three stories or events involving Joshua, but not in the book of Joshua? Maybe you can. If you can't, you just say, oh, uh, all right. We're finding, we want to find out just if you know anything about Joshua. We, we often know, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. But what about the man that said that? Is not someone's background important to see where God brought someone? Number four, true or false, now you have a 50% chance. Helping you, all right? True or false? Joshua is listed in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11. True or false? Joshua is listed in that great list of Old Testament saints. Hall of Faith, Hebrews 11. True or false? Joshua is listed in that group. And question number five, question number five. How many times is Joshua mentioned in the New Testament? I'm going to give you multiple choice. I'm going to just all of your uh, high school days are coming back. Multiple choice, true, false, etc. Short answer, all right, except for essay. Number five, how many times is Joshua mentioned in the New Testament? Is it A, less than three times? Is it B, four to seven times? Or is it C, more than seven times? How many times is Joshua mentioned in the New Testament? Is it A, less than three? B, four to seven, C, more than seven. And I got a short bonus. And by the way, I hope you're doing this because the winner, we're going to get your paper, I'm going to put it in the bulletin board right outside my office. I have a star I'm going to put on that. I want people to see it. Here's your bonus. How old was Joshua when he took over as the leader for Moses? How old was Joshua when he took over and became the leader after Moses died. 
All right, there you go. Can't repeat any. You're on your own honesty policy. We read the very last chapter of the book of Joshua. Joshua's most famous, well-known, most remembered quote of anything he ever said. And it's well worth remembering. As for me and my house, we're serving the Lord. A couple verses on, you're going to see that it says he gave up the ghost at 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance. You know what his lasting legacy was? A verse we don't usually read. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua. Don't stop there. Any parents, that's all you're interested in. They, served, they obeyed all the days they were in the house. And all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua, and when it, which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. Well, that's a pretty great legacy. They didn't just serve the Lord. Now, it doesn't mean every single person. We understand that. Certainly there were rebels and murmurs and sin. But uh, largely they served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days after Joshua, another generation, before they rebelled, book of Judges. So... What about the man? Do we know anything about him? Do we appreciate it? Do we know his journey? Do we know what God did? Is not the Bible given to us for examples? Can we not learn from the very life of Joshua how God works with people? Can he not work with you the same way? Many people discount the Old Testament, Old Testament characters. No, no, no. God hasn't changed. All right? The way God works with man, God works with man. Now, we know that they're different. We're not talking about revelation. We're not talking about signs and visions and things like that. But God's dealings with man is basically always the same. All right, here we go. Number one, we're going to go quick here. A well-known Bible trivia question involves Joshua and his father. A lot of times it's worded this way. What Bible character didn't have parents is usually the way it's worded. And then you're like, huh? All right, and the answer is Joshua, the son of Nun, N-U-N. That's a play on word. Joshua, the son of Nun. He, he, none. He didn't have any parents. Just, he, none. All right. So Joshua, the son of Nun, N-U-N. All right. If you didn't get that one, chalk it down for the future. Use it on someone. All right. Number two. What tribe was he from? Levi, Ephraim, Judah, Benjamin. The answer is Ephraim. Ephraim. He was not from Levi or any of the priestly tribe. He was not from Judah, the most famous. And Benjamin, he was from the tribe of Ephraim. Number three. Can you name two to three stories, events involving Joshua not found? Most of the stories we know, Joshua and the, we can think of the songs. Joshua and the battle of Jericho. Hope you know, and the walls came tumbling. All right, jo oh, Joshua and the, the two spies he sent out to, to Jericho. And, and Joshua and, and, and all these things. And, and the sun stood still in the battle. You know, that's all, those are all in the book of Joshua, though. Uh, can you think of any, anybody? Anybody who's got one for me? Just raise your hand. Who's got one? A story involving Joshua... Uh-oh. Uh-oh. One of them involves raising your hand. Hint, hint. Nathan? Okay, Joshua was one of the 12 spies. All right? The 12 spies who went to... That's in the book of Numbers. All right? And the 12 spies went to spy out the land. All right? Ten were bad and two were good. Hope you know that song. Maybe you don't. All right? Uh, two were... Uh, Joshua and Caleb. All right? Gave you a hint about the raise the hand. Sandy, did you have one? Or was that the same one? Which one would you have? Okay, all right, very good. That's dealing with the Ten Commandments, and it has, ties in a little bit with the golden calf there a little bit. Uh-huh, that famous scene of coming down, and Moses throws down the Ten Commandments, the golden calf. Well, Joshua was there with him, halfway up the mountain there with him. All right, very good. I you know we got the hint of the hands. Well, that involves that story. Moses got weird. Remember, his hands were up. They would win the battle. Hands went down. Malachites would win. Joshua was the captain of the military. And Aaron and Hur, not H-E-R, all right. That's a good, another Bible, good trivia. Name who the, Aaron and Hur. Who was she? No, no. All right. H-U-R, son of none. So Joshua was involved in some stories. We may not know that much. 
But go back and read again Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and you'll see a lot about Joshua. Number four, true or false, Joshua is listed in the Hall of Faith, Hebrews 11. Let's everybody together give us your answer. Be bold. True or false? False. <laughs> that, that answer is true. All right, no, no, your answer is true. The false is true. All right? If that is, he is not mentioned in the Hall of Faith, although the story of Jericho is. It's an interesting verse. You have all the Old Testament. You have Moses, and then Je but you did not have Joshua's name, although it says, by faith, the walls of Jericho came down. But Joshua's name is not mentioned, all right? Number five, how many times does Joshua mention the New Testament? A, less than three. B, four to seven. C, more than seven. The correct answer is A, zero. Joshua was never mentioned in the New Testament. None. Nada. All right. Might surprise you there. What? Interesting. Not mentioned at all. And the bonus. How old was Joshua when he took over for Moses? Seventy. Any other guesses? I did give you the hint that it says he died here at 110. What was that? I heard it. 40, I heard different ones, 70. Well, no, that's an interesting question. I, it's a, typically, it's said to be 80. Um, we're going to see that. You have, it's hard to find that in there. You sort of have to it, I, I normally assume. So there's not tr necessarily a true answer. 80 is usually what's held to. He died at 110. We believe he was the leader for at least 30 years. All right, we can go, we'll look at that a little bit here, all right? So a little bit of fun there. If you say, boy, I didn't get any of those. Now, again, some of them you could have guessed and gotten it correct. I gave you some multiple choices and things like that. But if you say, I don't really know a lot about it, let me encourage you, even through this short study, if you have never really studied Bible characters, uh, that's a great way of devotions. It's a great way of a Bible study. You personally, by the way, you dig into a Bible character, you study it, and then what do you do with it? You should apply it to your life. What do you learn about God? What do you learn about people? What do you learn about that from the Scripture? And then it's time for you to teach that to others. It's time for you to teach that in ladies' Bible studies. It's time to teach that on a one-to-one. -one. time to teach that in your own home and family. It's time to teach that with a, a Bible. Those kind of things. Absolutely. You need to teach that. Not just to take in the Word uh, but to yourself. I was reminded of that just uh, yesterday, or uh, this morning as I was driving in. You know, you glance over, you see a lake, you see a pond, all right? And the one that's usually a very beautiful, probably called a pond, and, but boy, full of just scum. Now, we've had a lot of rain, understand that, and, but you know the difference, right? You've got, usually when you see that pond with all the green, that just lets you know that's a pond that you're usually, now there can be exceptions, that usually that's a pond that two things. In other words, it's just got water coming in, and that's it and the waters get stagnant and it gets yucky, or the outlet for the water to go out is broken or clogged. If you go to Servant's Heart, all right, beautiful lake, as you go in there over the little bit of the dike there where you drive in, as soon as, you, as you're driving in, you look down there, there is the, there's the outlet, all right? They got a, they, somebody dammed that up years ago, made a nice lake. The creek is on the other end if you go on the zip line. And so that water is always coming in. It's always coming in. But if there was no outlet, that water, especially if it that would turn nasty and green, it would just get yucky and just full of blood. And we've all seen those, some of those. Some of those ponds where you could almost walk on it. It looks like there's grass growing. All right. Like, Ugh, that's a stagnant pond. That's, that's not good. And so you have that outlet so that, number one, it keeps the lake the same level. And then you've got that metal pipe, and then the water goes right into that whoosh, and goes down the other side. That's a free flowing. It keeps it a little bit of fresh. Well, that same thing with a believer. What do you do with all that you get? As the stream of the Bible comes into your heart and mind, what do you do with it? Many of you, you get a lot of it. You, the stream of Sunday school, the stream of preaching, the stream of Sunday night, the stream of personal devotions, the stream of ladies' Bible study, the stream of, I mean, you just get lots of it. But where is it? What do you do with it all? For many believers, it just sits there. It just sits there. there there's, you have no outlet. You don't, you don't do anything with it. It just sits there and it becomes, a lot of times, that, that believer often will become like a pond. Moldy. Yucky. <laughs> And, and, that, and if, you, if that's you, perhaps the problem is you, you don't have any outlet. 
You're supposed to pass those things on to your family, your spouse, your friends. You're supposed to live it. You're supposed to share it with unbelievers. You're supposed to be teaching others also, and not just to keep it to yourself. And so as we look at a short Bible study here, we're not going to be able to cover all of his life, obviously, in one little Sunday school lesson. But we're going to at least get started a little bit here. Perhaps I can stir you up a little bit there. Again, Joshua, I think, is one of the top Bible characters for all young men. We, I taught it often in our boys' Sunday school class. We have teen boys' class. I tried to focus a lot more on male leadership. Nehemiah, uh, Joshua was a book we covered a lot. Not just Joshua, but the whole book, all right? Uh, David, Joseph, those are good things. But all of us can learn great truths about God and about us from Joshua, all right? Many of you may or may not be familiar with this. Joshua's journey or his timeline are, are all with S's. So you may have heard this or learned this before. You may have studied this. You may not have. If you haven't, perhaps you would jot this down. I think it will be help. Slave to soldier to spy to successor. That's Joshua's life. Slave, then soldier. I, I skipped one. I'm sorry. Then servant. There's five. I think I already gave you four the first time. Slave. Soldier, servant, spy, successor. Successor meaning he took over and succeeded Moses as leader. Most of the time we're interested in the last one. Wow, look what they are now. They're, look at, uh, yeah, but look at the journey. He went from a slave to a soldier, to a servant, to a spy, to a successor. It's believed, here's typically his belief of timeline. Forty years in Egypt as a child, as a young man, largely as a slave. Forty years with Israel, once Israel was delivered, after the plagues in Moses, forty years as a soldier, then a servant, and then a spy, and then thirty years believed to be as a successor or leader of Israel, the whole book of Joshua. Because we do know he died at a hundred and 10, all right? 110 years old. So what about this guy named Joshua? What, what can we learn? We're not going to be able to cover all five of these, but I'll try to give you just a little bit of each and maybe just whet your appetite, challenge a little bit in the Lord. You know that sometimes, I hope this is true, sometimes the nicest, most cheerful, godly people have pasts that would shock you if they ever wanted to tell you. But most of the time, they won't. Now, there's nothing wrong with sharing your past in a testimony. Those are good. Those are helpful. Paul did the same thing. He said, this, he didn't dwell on a whole lot of it. He'd give it to you. Didn't, this is what I used to be. You can read the book of Acts. You know, I used to persecute the church. I used to waste the church. I used to do all this. Oh, my goodness. But now, the, the large majority of your testimony should not just necessarily always be on the past, but on what you are now. And you'll see that, I think, in, in Scripture, all right? I think it takes both. But... It, the testimony should be, now that I'm saved, whoa, look at all that God has been doing, all right? And make sure God gets the credit, all right? And so, what would you be like if you were a slave for 40 years? And you were part of this church? Would everybody know it? Would you constantly talk about it? Would it be like, flavor everything you did? Now you might say, well, of course it would. That'd be human nature. I mean, I don't know when they became slaves in Egypt. I don't know that every single person of Israel was a slave. I don't know about all the women and all the children. I don't know all the rules. It doesn't always tell us that. I can guarantee you that young men were. At a certain age, I'm sure a boy, young man, became part of the unpaid working crew as a slave for Egypt and Pharaoh. No doubt about it. Now, I don't think anybody can prove anything other than that, but it's likely that at a certain age, you were going to work. You'd certainly the hard physical stuff, we can see Exodus chapter 1 and 2 where it talks about the, the slaves and how they made them work and all of that before Moses and all that they did and with rigor and just beating them and being, making it harsh because their numbers were getting big. So if that was you, if you were a slave for a large majority of your life, if you were treated what they treated in Exodus 1 and 2, if, I don't know if he was whipped. I don't know if he was beaten. I don't know exactly. I, we can guesstimate. But if that's what you were for years, do you know that most of us would say, oh, yeah, that's why they're that way. And we might even pat them on the back and say, you have a reason to be that way. I understand why you are so full of rage. I understand why you never smile. 
Understand why you don't trust anybody. Understand why you're bitter. Understand why you don't even... Do you know that there's, it's never recorded anything Joshua ever said about those years? Those years happen. They're true. They're part of his life. You wouldn't know it, though. Doesn't mean he never struggled. Doesn't mean it never affected him. It had to. He's human. Isn't it refreshing to know that your past does not have to define you unless you let it? There are some people that your past is all you think about because that's all you meditate on every day. You only ever think on all the bad. You only ever think on all that happened. You don't meditate on God's goodness and God's glory and God's deliverance. He was a slave. Now, I do find it interesting. He is the son of none. Do you know that that's mentioned 29 times in the Bible? Joshua, son of none. Joshua, son of none. 29 times. Now, if you were the Holy Spirit, would you do that? How many times did it say Moses, son of Amram? Moses, son of Amram. Moses, son of Amram. Moses. Joshua, the son of Nun. Joshua, the son of Nun. Joshua, the son of Nun. That doesn't seem very important. Why, would, why do we care? <laughs> if you're being honest. Some have never even thought on that. Joshua, the son of Nun. Joshua. Now, perhaps it's as simple as there were lots of Joshuas. And God wanted us to know that this was Joshua the son of Nun, not the other Joshua's, all right? Mike, the son of, not Mike Goble or Mike this, Mike the, or, or different people, different names. That could be the reason. But how about this? God wanted us to know that Joshua was the son of Nun. Nun was his father. And Nun, N-U-N, was a good man. You know what? There's no information at all, ever, on Nun. None. Are you with me? All right, some of you. Oh, oh, All right. Nothing. No, no, you have nothing about it ever. Except 29 times, Joshua, the son of none. Now, can you become a great godly person and have a wicked, ungodly parent? You better believe it. Why? Because God. You can even have a parent. All right? Can you have a great godly parent and turn out as a bum and a loser? And absolutely lost. You better believe it. Joshua, the son of none. However, I'm going to... I'm gonna, read a little bit into this and say, you know what? God puts it in there 29 times. I have a feeling that Nun was a good man, may have been a godly man, certainly instilled character in his son, certainly taught him how to obey, how to work hard, how to be brave, how to have duty, how to have a servant's heart. Maybe taught him the scriptures or whatever they knew had been passed on from his father and going to Ephraim and going back. Certainly talked about Jehovah and God and probably said, son, God promised our father Abraham that he would deliver us. He even told Abraham how many years after 400 years. And son, I'm a pretty good math person. It's coming soon. It's coming soon. Oh, we, <laughs> I know how long we've been here, son. God said it, and Jehovah keeps his word, and it could be you. It could be someone near you. Come on, don't give up, son. God's going to do it. You know, I don't know. We're not told about him, but he was a slave. I don't, that doesn't mean he whistled every day he worked. doesn't mean he never hated the, the Egyptians. Perhaps we were never told that. Born and raised in Ephraim, in Egypt, this tribe of Ephraim. Does anybody remember? Just say it. What, who's Ephraim? Joseph's son, not Jacob's, all right? Not one of the 12 sons of Jacob, but Joseph, who got a double blessing. Well, this is one of Joseph's two boys, Ephraim and Manasseh. There is no tribe of Joseph, all right? And so Joseph's two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, became tribes. So this man, Joshua, is from the tribe of Ephraim, who is from Joseph, one of the great men in all the Bible. What a godly heritage. Wow. I don't know how many generations, but your great, 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 great grandfather Joseph also needed delivered. He was in a pit. He was in prison. God kept his word. God's going to keep his word, son, what he told Abraham. Look for that. He was a slave. A slave. A slave. 
But you know what happened? He became a soldier. Go to Exodus 17. Do you know the very first time you read about him is Exodus 17? No mention of Joshua before Exodus 17. Turn with me. Exodus 17. Use your Bibles. You can't study the Bible and study a Bible character without using your Bibles and turning. So Exodus 17. First mention of Joshua. He's going from a slave. Boy, can you imagine being Joshua? Whoa. I mean, you were there. You saw all the plagues. You were 35, 40. You, you, wow, you saw the water turn to blood. You saw the lice, the frogs. I mean, you name them. You, the firstborn, you put the blood on the doorpost. You personally, Joshua, you saw the Egyptians come and give you diamonds and gold and rubies. Get out of here. And you were part of that group of two to four million with carts and animals and old people and children going out of Egypt after 400 years of slavery. Whoa, rejoicing and praising God. And you crossed the Red Sea. You saw Pharaoh and his army killed. Whoa. I mean, think about all that Joshua experienced with all those. Whoa, the manna and all the things. Whoa. First time you read about him, though, is Exodus 17. The story of Moses and his hands being raised. <laughs> This is after the Red Sea. This is going to Canaan. This is after uh, manna has just been introduced in the previous chapter, I believe, chapter 16. The Sabbath first being mentioned, if you go back to our last Sunday school lesson. The Sabbath given to Israel, about to be instituted here. All right? And now, guess what? This ragged group of two to four million. Oh, they got a lot of people. But they're not a military. I mean, they're not trained. They've just been slaves for years. Now, all of a sudden, they're attacked. They're attacked by who? The Amalekites. All right? Bible, Bible history lesson. Who did the Amalekites come from? Amalekites, descendants of Amalek, son of Lot. All right? Remember Lot? Remember chapter 19 of Genesis? Lot's daughters got him drunk. Had physical relations, two boys born, right? Wasn't it Moab, the Moabites, Amalek, the Amalekites? Oh, my goodness, thorn in the flesh. All right? And so the Amalekites, so technically they're all related. They attack them. So what happens? There's a battle. Look at chapter 17, verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel and Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, first time you'll read his name. Now, why did he choose Joshua? We're not told anything special about Joshua. He's just one of, the, he's one of the slaves. He's one of the people of Israel now. He's a healthy younger man, maybe 40. I don't know. Josh, Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. We don't have time to read this whole thing there, but as, as he held the rod of God, notice, not the rod of Moses, rod of God. I mean, it was like watching a ball game where the football just can't be stopped. But as soon as he, oh, you ever do that? You ever see those kids in school? Oh, you know, they're writing so much. You ever do that? As soon as that happened, boom, the, the tide shifted in the mallet. It was like, oh, put your hands back up. Well, now, all right, you can't do it. And so you have, you have a one side, Aaron's holding his hand up. And over here, you've got her holding his hand up because you can't do it. And so what happens? God gives a great victory. And who's the captain? Who's the general? Joshua. Now, I have no idea why he chose Joshua. Did God tell him? Probably. But there's a million men, maybe. Half a million fighting men. Joshua is chosen, and it says he does exactly what Moses tells him to do, and there is a great victory. Look at verse 14. The Lord said unto Moses, after it was over, write this for memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. Can we just give a quick application? Do you write any of the stuff down that happens to you where God gives great victory so one day your kids can read about it? Because all they're going to be left with is memories, and be like, I don't know. I don't know, I think. I don't know. Does anybody know? I don't know. You're going, to trust, you're going to trust your mind? That's where legends are born. That's where things that aren't true are happen over the years. You pass on stories that aren't true. Notice, write it in a book what happened here today and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remnant of Amalek 
from under heaven. So they didn't wipe them all out, but he said, one day we're going to wipe them all out. Now, isn't that interesting? God has already chosen Joshua. He said, you, you rehearse it and don't let Joshua ever forget this. This is one of the, the first battle in a, in a series of many battles, all right? A soldier, wow. First task, what do we see? Obedience, skill, determination, and a leader of men. Not everybody's going to follow you. You don't understand that? There's a lot of people that want to be leaders, but you're, you're crass. You're arrogant. You're rude. You're not a servant. You're not humble. You're not teachable. It's your way or the highway. You don't know how to deal with different personalities. You can't handle... There's a lot of wannabe leaders. You're not a leader just because you're by yourself. You're a leader when you're put with a group of people that don't know you, and we'll find out if they follow you. Are they going to follow you out of force? Yeah, sure, you're following. You know, some people, that's all they do. They yell and scream and threaten. Oh, are they really following you? <laughs> they may be behind you, but are they following you? I mean, that's pretty amazing, right? Joshua is chosen, and he leads a great victory. We're not told he has any knowledge of being a soldier. And men follow him, much like David. I mean, remember when Saul plucked David and made him a military leader? I mean, David was probably a teenager. You think an older guy is going to follow a kid? Well, yeah. You have godly character. You're the real deal and authentic. They'll follow you. Nobody follows a fake, not very long. If you're not faithful to the Lord right now, right now, stop dreaming about the future. If you're not faithful to God right now, right now, boom, forget it. You're not going to be faithful, though. You can fantasize about if I was over here, if I lived here, I did this, it's going to be out. No, you're not. You're not. This is years from him being the leader. He was given a task, and he was faithful. God said, now we'll move you to the next one. You can't be faithful in this. You're not going to be faithful in something else. All right? If you can't be faithful in tithing off a dollar, you're not going to tithe off $100. You won't tithe off $10 million. And you will not tithe if you won the lottery, which you shouldn't be playing, for the billion dollars. Although your heart will tell you you would. But why would you tithe off a big amount if you can't tithe? I mean, you, you can't trust God with 10 cents out of a dollar? But you, but you will trust him with 10 million. That don't make sense. You can't trust God with a dollar out of 10? Why would you trust him with a big amount? Be faithful wherever God puts you. Well, our time is about up. Let's move to one more real quick. Exodus 24. Exodus 24. We'll have to do a part two probably, or you can finish it, because it's, it's a great Bible character. He was a slave, but then he became a soldier. And now he becomes a servant. Exodus 24. Take a look at verse 13. Exodus 24. Now, many people don't realize how many times Moses went up to Mount Sinai. First time, he went up by himself. The next time, at the chap beginning of chapter 24, he was told to go up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, 70 of the elders. In chapter 24, verse 13, it says, Moses rose up, and his, his soldier, his minister, his servant, Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God. Hmm. So what are we looking at here? This is where Moses goes to the top of Mount Sinai. And Moses is there 40 days and 40 nights. That's the last verse of chapter 24. Remember, he goes up at 40 days. He doesn't eat. He fasts. He's not eating or drinking for 40 days and 40 nights. This is, this is the beginning of the story where he doesn't come back. And they say, well, Moses is dead. Aaron, we've got to make us a golden calf. Make us a god. Because we don't think Moses come back. We need somebody. Moses is up there the entire time. But guess who's also halfway up there? Joshua. The Bible says that Joshua had gone about halfway, Moses the whole way to the top. Now, we're not told that Joshua was there for 40 days. Maybe he was there the exact same 40 days. Maybe he came down on occasion. I don't know that. But I know one thing. Joshua is called his minister, his servant, his right-hand man. He goes halfway up with him. And guess what happens when you get to Exodus 32? When God says, Moses, you better get down there because there's rebellion in the camp. There's idolatry, there's fornication, there's immorality. They're down there doing wickedness just like Egypt. You better get down there. The golden calf and dancing and rock, rock music was being played. Absolutely. They were playing Egyptian rock music, remember? How do we know that? Because who came running to Moses? 
jo Moses coming down with the Ten Commandments. I don't know if they look like we'd like to draw them. All right. All right. Moses came down, and guess who comes and says, Joshua, Moses, Moses, there's war in the camp. They're being attacked. <laughs> it's like the Amalekites again. No, no, they're playing their music. That's exactly what he said. No, they got the... Exactly. He said, no, it sounds like war. It sounds like fighting and screaming. It sounds like rockiness. It doesn't make any sense. No, no, it's the voice of them which do play and do worship false gods. And he, but there was Joshua, his minister, his servant. Could you serve somebody? Would you be able to be a servant for 30, 40 years? A servant. Now, I mean... I'm not even talking about like serving your spouse or your kids. I mean, just being a servant. You're a servant of somebody, and you you serve them. And when they tell you, to, I mean, there's no. You, they tell you to do it, you do it, and you do it happily, and you do it cheerfully. If it's fighting about it, you fight about it. If it's bring you water, you bring you water. If it's take care of that problem, you take care of that problem. You answer to Moses. And he was a servant. He was his minister for decades. Yes, some of that was learning and being an apprentice. But you are just. I mean, you know, most time we don't like to serve people. Well, I wouldn't do it that way. We question everything they do and say, you know, God wants us to be a servant. I'll finish with this. We did, we're not going to get to the spy. But that's another great story. Think about it. Choose 12 men. You can only pick 12 men out of 600,000. There are 600,000 fighting men. You need to pick 12. One from each tribe. They are going to be the special forces, elite, black ops, literally. Those 12 men are going to go across the Jordan River. How'd they get across that? With weapons into enemy territory of Canaan. They have no backup, no support. And for 40 days, they're going to spy out the land. They're completely on their own. They get killed, they get killed. And then they're going to come back. And you better choose the most trusted, most respected, most brave, loyal, faithful man you can find. Joshua was one of the 12, the only man from Ephraim. Now, let me ask you, if you were part of 600,000, would anybody pick you? Would anybody pick me? Do I have any character qualities besides, uh, you know, I can, I can, today we say I can shoot a gun. What, why did they pick Joshua? He had proven himself faithful as a soldier. He had proven himself faithful as a servant. And he was one of the 12 spies, and we know he was godly because when he came back, right, 10 were bad and two were good. Joshua and Caleb, the only two that said, trust God. We can whoop those giants, not a problem with God. Don't you forget what he did before? And there's only two people that entered the promised land from the original group. Think about that. Only two from the original group that left Egypt. Only two that made it into Canaan. Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and and of those two, only one was Moses' successor to lead the entire group of Israel into a land full of enemies and giants and people who hated God. Whew. It'd be a lot easier to be Moses in charge. <laughs> uh, Secondhand man's a little easier than being the main guy. All right? And yet God used Joshua in a great way. Well, our time is up. I didn't quite cover everything, but I hope I covered enough to stir you up. Hey, and by the way, it's the same God. That's the same God as the God of Joshua. Would you let him work in your life? Would you be willing to be a servant? Uh, Father, we love you. We thank you. Thank you that you're not just the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're not just the God of Joshua and David and Ruth and Esther. You're the God of us today. Lord, may we love you. May we be loyal. May we be faithful in Jesus' name. Amen.